Thank you very much. That was a very exciting and, and insightful presentation and illustrates the, the theme of this morning's meeting. So I'm, again, uh, a great deal of pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Kahn, who's on the faculty at Princeton University and has been a long uh, a distinguished physician and a long, long-standing advocate of the One Health concept. Laura, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very happy to uh, follow up with my colleagues, Chris and Rita. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about um, establishing a global workforce using a One Health framework. Let's see, how do I forward this? So the traditional subjects in schools of public health that have evolved over the 20th century include biostatistics, epidemiology, health policy and management, which typically focus on hospital management and uh, health, ad health insurance administration, population and family health, the sociomedical sciences, and environmental health, which primarily focus on human health risks, including carcinogens and toxic waste, how we measure them and how we uh, monitor them and follow them. But as you've heard in the previous talks, the challenges that we face in the 20th century are substantial. Uh, and perhaps one could argue then that these subjects that are taught in schools of public health that are so focused solely on human health rather than using a One Health concept that we should rethink uh, the curriculum. We're faced with massive uh, waste production, both human and animal, which leads to water and food contamination. The effects of climate change can impact uh, potential food shortages. Of course, we're dealing with worsening antibiotic resistance because of uh, indiscriminate use, uh, but also the um, antibiotic uh, residues in waste that's not uh, adequately uh, treated and often put on uh, agricultural fields. Environmental degradation, uh, mental illness, which we don't talk about, public mistrust of vaccines, the emerging infections that have been presented, and, and as I mentioned, the climate change. In terms of emerging infections um, we, uh, and climate change specifically, uh, we should divide it up between the arthropod-borne diseases that I've listed here and the non-arthropod-borne diseases. Uh, with the exception of rabies, many of these non-arthropod-borne diseases uh, are the result of uh, humanity's quest for meat. Uh, many of them evolve either directly or indirectly from uh, meat production or uh, meet uh, the, the, the raising of, uh, of animals. Uh, some come from the consumption of bush meat. In terms of emerging zoonotic diseases, you've heard already about the One Health concept, and I would argue that global health must be viewed with a One Health lens rather than solely focusing on the human, human health uh, and uh, requires a reassessment. So uh, professional education and training in One Health, what would that look like? There would be a greater emphasis on zoonotic diseases, and including entomology, parasitology. There is some, uh, some courses taught on that, but I would argue not enough. More emphasis on virology and bacteriology. Uh, schools of public health should t teach more on food safety and security, global health and agriculture. There's a direct tie between the two. We should be teaching the students about that. Water purity, sanitation, hygiene, both human and animal, domestic and wild health. Now, ecosystem health. As I mentioned, we primarily teach environmental health, focusing on toxins uh, and contaminants. Uh, but how would one then teach ecosystem health, and what exactly is a healthy environment? Now, Dr. Colwell has illustrated the importance of monitoring not only weather, but also ocean conditions, whether or not there's chlorophyll. Uh, there's many things that we can monitor in the environment that directly impact health that we are not doing that should be taught and should be institutionalized in the way health, uh, public health, global health, is practiced. Uh, and we should be teaching One Health policy to the students as well. One Health, uh, health care, uh, as you've been discussing, is team-based. And uh, in business schools, 
pretty much all of the um, uh, assignments are taught or are uh, assigned to be uh, team conducted, case based, problem solving, interdisciplinary, as uh, Chris Olson illustrated in his talk. Um, that should be the wave of the future. Uh, instruction should not be focused solely on individual assignments, but focused on team based, cross cultural, qualitative, and quantitative. Now, uh, in public health, there are core competencies that are, have already been uh, developed, and I have listed them here. This is through the uh, uh, Public uh, Health Professionals uh, Council, and um, I think these can be expanded upon to include a One Health focus. Uh, Chris Olson has also uh, shown for you the uh, fieldwork projects that their uh, program uh, administers. This can be both local, regional, national, and international team-based, and that should be promoted at all schools of public health because that's what's going to be needed in a global workforce to be able to go out as teams and uh, assess the health situation. Now, as I also previously mentioned, um, schools of public health, when they teach health policy, they primarily focus solely on hospital administration, health insurance, and I think that should be expanded to include public health, including disaster preparedness, biodefense, food security. The whole curriculum could be expanded in a much broader way. Students should be taught how to critically evaluate public health programs, how crises are responded to, and develop strategies for improvement. We need creative thinkers and problem solvers who think beyond just the hospital walls. Now, one of the challenges of uh, implementing a global health workforce is that, well, we're already having shortages, and at least in terms of human health, in 2006, the World Health Organization identified a minimum density of 22.8 skilled health professionals per 10,000 population to deliver uh, basic health coverage but they found that 83 countries have fallen below this threshold and 100 countries fell below the threshold of 34.5 health professionals per 10,000 population. In sub-Saharan Africa, for example, there are acute shortages of doctors, nurses, and midwives. And in looking at the distribution of uh, health workers, well, you've got uh, a better distribution in the Americas and Europe compared to places that really desperately need health workers, including Africa and Southeast Asia. With the global veterinary workforce, it's, a, it's much worse. Um, first of all, they're behind in defining what the basic educational requirements and workforce needs are for a veterinary workforce. The World Organization for Animal Health, the OIE, is advocating for people working in veterinary services to have a defined education and skills with minimum competencies, but there's great variation in the, how veterinary medicine is taught in different countries. Now, the OIE has an animal health uh, database. They have veterinary and paraveterinary workforce data available, but it's very spotty, and the quality is questionable. But I'm showing you here some of the data from that, work for, uh, from that database. And um, unfortunately, there's a lot of gaps. So for example, India, Lib Liberia, Malaysia, and Russia have no data at all. So we have no idea what their veterinary or paraveterinary workforce is. But some countries clearly have more of a veterinary workforce than others. And if we're talking about having global health and you need to have healthy animals, well, uh, having a, uh, an adequate veterinary medical capacity in your country is absolutely critical. Now, I could not find any data on a global health, environmental health, or ecosystem health workforce. So uh, we have no idea what's out there, or if there's indeed any uh, substantial workforce out there. And one problem is, I think, is because we don't really teach the proper environmental or ecosystem health that's needed in the 21st century. And uh, again, I think it's uh, important that we teach the workforce 
the skills, the quantitative and qualitative skills to properly evaluate the environment, not just the exposure, not just the presence of toxins uh, and contaminants, but also the weather conditions, the, uh, uh, the chlorophyll in water, uh, the life forms in water, the microbes in water. Uh, we could do a much better job with that, particularly in a global capacity. So I would argue then that there's much room for improvement. Uh, we should be educating health professionals using a One Health framework that would fill many gaps, both uh, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, we have to have professionals with the education and training to assess the entire milieu that people live and work, not just focused within hospital or clinic walls. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my colleagues of the One Health Initiative, Bruce Kaplan, Tom Monath, Jack Woodall, Lisa Conti. We um, manage this website, onehealthinitiative.com, that serves as a global repository for all news and information pertaining to One Health. And I want to thank you for your time and attention.